Okay, while well, you're turning there, Ecclesiastes 7. Um, in the time that human beings have lived on this earth, we've accomplished quite a bit, okay? And you can look at how our lives are today and how the lives of human beings were thousands of years ago and understand that a lot of progress has been made. Most of us uh, get to sleep in a shelter that is safe and secure, then when the weather turns cold, we're going to be able to uh, keep our uh, climate comfortable in our homes. Uh, anytime we're hungry, we can go to the fridge, we can go to any number of restaurants around us, that for a long time there were these basic human essentials uh, that really were a struggle for us as humanity that we seem to have figured out. You even think medically, uh, issues that even a hundred years ago were common killers of human beings like tuberculosis, which is now curable and preventable, and there's a lot of obstacles we've overcome as a race, and yet one of the obstacles we haven't been able to overcome since we've been on this earth is death. That hasn't stopped people from trying, though, in a 2013 news article entitled Billionaires Vow to Fight Death. We read, we still can't stop the brute fact of death, but this isn't stopping five billionaires who are trying to lead the human race out of mortality. First, there's billionaire Peter Thiel, who has invested heavily in organizations like the SENS Foundation, which is devoted to developing rejuvenation biotechnologies, and nothing's panned out yet. Then there's William Andreg, the founder of a Silicon Valley nanotechnology technology startup, who claims that the, he plans to live for millions, billions, or hundreds of billions of years. That business quietly went out of business in the summer of 2014. Then there's Russian transhumanist multimillionaire Dmitry Itzkov, who launched the 2045 initiative and offers the promise that humans will be immortal by the year 2045, just as soon as we make a leap into artificial machine bodies. But the billionaire who brings the most fiery passion to the cause by far is Larry Ellison, who gives out more than $40 million to the Ellison Medical Foundation to understand lifespan development processes. According to Forbes magazine, Ellison's net worth is $43 billion, and he recently said, death makes me very angry. It doesn't make any sense to me. Death has never made any sense to me. How can a person be there and then just vanish and not be there? It's a question, again, we've been grappling with since we've been on this earth. And if you're not a billionaire with the resources to try and fight an obstacle seemingly as insurmountable as death, typically you fall to one of two extremes in your approach to it. Maybe you're more in the camp of Willie Nelson, which I understand is a little bit of a dated reference, uh, but not someone who's ever seemed to be concerned about much in this life, and you can tell in this quote. When asked about death by Rolling Stone in 2013, Nelson said, oh, we're all going to die. Who was it? Seneca the thinker that said, you should look at death and comedy with the same expression of countenance. You can't be afraid of the living or dying. You live and you die, and that's just what happens, so you can't be afraid of it. And then on the other end, you have someone like American writer Susan Sontag. Matthew Levering, in his book about Sontag, writes this, the famous American writer Susan Sontag died of cancer in 2004 at the age of 71. When her cancer returned after a long remission, Sontag was struggling desperately against it. She refused to hear that she was dying, even in the midst of her treatments. She dreamt and spoke continually of what she could do when she got out of the hospital, and once more took up the reins of her life. The future was everything. Living was everything. Getting back to work was everything. She insisted that she would make a completely fresh start and would write in a new way. She would do the things that she had always wanted to do rather than wasting her time doing things that she had previously done out of mere duty. Her son claimed that she concentrated her limited energy in undertaking a revolt against death, and she died unreconciled to her own extinction. Sontag, of course, did not believe in God or in life after death. Her sole hope consisted in medical and scientific data and in the treatment plans of her physicians. Her son said she thought the world a charnel house and couldn't get enough of it. She thought herself unhappy and wanted to live unhappy for as long as she possibly could. Weeping and panicked as she neared her death, she told the nurse she was dying with the implication that the whole thing was horrific and absurd. Reflecting on her mother's body in a Paris graveyard beside other famous writers, he concluded that unless you believe in spirits or the Christian fairy tale of resurrection, those uh, who have died simply no longer exist and never will exist again. 
Admittedly, all of this talk of death or the, the, just the idea of death makes us uncomfortable and we spend a huge amount of time and effort and resources distracting ourselves from its inevitability, keeping it at the margins of our life, trying to distance ourselves from it for as long as we can. And so at one level, we simply want to ask this question today, what is the Christian response to the problem of death and dying? And what hope does the gospel give us in the midst of its seeming inevitability? But secondly, and maybe more importantly, as we turn to Ecclesiastes 7 this morning, here's what we discover, that it's possible we've spent, again, endless amounts of time and money and energy trying to forget something that God actually intended to be at the forefront of our minds as a tool for our good. And we'll see this again as we turn to Ecclesiastes 7 verses 1 to 4. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. And Solomon's advice here seems rather counterintuitive and and depressing to most people. That basically he's just said, given the option, whether you go to a funeral or a party, you should choose the funeral because it will be better for you in the end. And he says this is the case because this is the end of all mankind. He spells this out a little more clearly if you look up just a few verses. Chapter 6, verse 12, when he writes of human beings, for who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which passes like a shadow. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And as Solomon assesses the human condition, here's what he knows. Our lives pass by quickly, and they all end in death. And it's like the most depressing TED Talk of all time, listening to Solomon through chapter 6 and chapter 7. But here's what he's clearly ticked off. It's be- our day of death is better than the day of our birth. It's better to go to the house of mourning. Sorrow is better than laughter. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. And the question obviously becomes, how can he believe these things? Now, we have to balance this with, with other things we see in Ecclesiastes, where Solomon will make comments like, there's nothing better for man to do in the days that he has on this earth than to eat and drink and enjoy the spouse of his youth. And so there's a balance to his wisdom here that it's good to find joy in the good gifts that God has given us in this life. But he also seems to be suggesting this. It's beneficial to us to remember that we'll die someday and to keep that at the forefront of our minds. Ian Pravon writes in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, death is human destiny should be deeply rooted in the inner person and be grasped by the mind, emotions, and will. It is part of the wisdom one needs in order to live a good life. Life, And he goes on to write, recognizing the brevity and preciousness of life, we should live seriously. And at a very practical level, remembering we will die someday can be a beneficial thing. It can reorganize our priorities. And when we remember that there's a finish line to all of this, we begin to reshape our life so that we're focusing on those things that are most important. It can help us live deliberately, knowing that uh, our days are numbered. We can make sure I'm giving my time and energy and resources to things that really matter. It allows us to make the most of every day when we remember that we don't know how many days we have. The psalmist utters the same prayer to God in Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And he too, like Solomon, ties wisdom to remembering There are a finite amount of days we have on this earth. And it's not just Christians who have recognized this as a beneficial thing. Even those who aren't religious have understood it's important to remember we don't have an unlimited amount of time here. Steve Jobs once said, when I was 17, I read a quote that went something like this. If you live each day as if it were your last, someday you'll certainly be right. It made an impression on me, and since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know something needs to change. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death. 
leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You're already naked. And you can see how as a general principle, remembering that we will die someday can be a helpful thing. Again, it can reorient where we're spending our effort, our time, and our energy. But if we simply stop there, if remembering our death simply becomes a productivity tool to help keep us focused, we've missed the underlying point of what Solomon is trying to drive at here. Again, as you think back to earlier parts of Ecclesiastes, he's assessing the significance of all that he's acquired in his life, all the knowledge, all the pleasure, the food, the sex, the laughter, the wealth. And the conclusion he came to was this, if this life is all that there is, all that we can see, then it's all ultimately meaningless because it doesn't benefit us in the end. And again, if we take Solomon's advice in Ecclesiastes 7 and use it as a tool to check more off on our to-do list, we've missed the main point of what he's arguing for here. Remembering we're going to die can help focus us. It can help us give our attention to the right things. But if we do that and we get to the end of our lives and we've maximized our productivity and success and investment in the right things... Does it really benefit us when we leave this earth? Lately, I've found a lot of encouragement. Um, the more time I've spent looking at Christian art, and I'll just say this to the artists and musicians in the room, we need you to help us understand the things of God, that there's a way in which you can bring to light the truth of God and God's Word that is done in a, a different way than when the Word is simply preached or spoken. And in particular, I've uh, really been drawn to this one particular form of Christian art called Christian icons. I apologize for the size of this. It's going to be hard to see. If you go to my social media, I had uploaded this earlier this week. But there was an icon I ran across as I was preparing to preach this sermon this week. And what you see in this picture, and this is why this is a, a helpful thing as we think through this issue today, this icon is called the Astonishment of Sizos. And in the picture, a monk who died in the 5th century is standing over the tomb of Alexander the Great. And so laying in this tomb, you see the skeleton of one of the most significant human beings who has ever stepped foot on this earth. He was a king by the age of 20. He eventually conquered half of the known world of his day. He's considered one of the greatest military leaders of all time who allegedly never lost a battle. And his reign ushered in the Hellenistic age, which has shaped human culture even to today. And if most of us are being honest, we're just trying to, you know, get some good grades, eat right, get more sleep. Uh, it's not an apt comparison to see what Alexander accomplished and what most of us will accomplish. And yet what this reminds us of is this, is for all of his success and all of his fame and all of his wealth, he still ended up in the same place that we're all going to end up. And for everything that he was able to accomplish on this earth, if it was just for the sake of his benefit here, the question the picture poses to us is this, what difference does it make in the end? Now, there's a way in which you could begin to conceptualize this idea that we're going to die someday and begin to live as if, so what does it matter how I live? Why try and accomplish anything? Why pursue any goal or accomplishment? And yet, it's when you begin to take these various pieces of wisdom that Solomon's giving us and you begin to tie them together that his overall point becomes clear. It's important to remember that we're going to die someday, Ecclesiastes 7, but it's also important to remember, as we saw last week, that there is a God whom we're to fear and to live in obedience to. Again, in chapter 12, he summarizes the main point of his entire book in verse 13 when he writes, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And again, it's when you begin to put these two things together. We will die and there is a God. There will be an end to this life. And when this life is done, I will stand before him that our eventual death begins to take on a further, deeper significance. The author of Hebrews says it this way in uh, chapter 9, verse 27. And just as it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And what Scripture begins to stress is this. It's important to remember that our days are numbered. Yes, it helps us live more faithfully, or uh, yes, it helps us live more um, deliberately in this life with the days that we have. And it can be beneficial at that level. 
But part of the reason that we remember that there is an end to this life is this, because what Scripture tells us is on that day when our life is done, we don't simply cease to exist, but that is the day when we stand before God and give an account for the life that we've lived. And if that's true, the question obviously becomes, well, how can I make sure I live, a, uh, I live a, in such a way in this life that God will be pleased with me when I stand before Him? How can I make sure I do the things that I need to do on this earth so that when I stand before God, uh, things go well for me, if there is a God and I will stand in judgment before Him? For thousands of years, human beings have tried to answer this question, and we've done it in a number of ways. I just need to make sure my good deeds outweigh my bad. I think that's the approach that most people have. If I am generally uh, do more good than bad, then when I stand before God, I'm pretty confident that I'll be okay. I need to make sure I'm doing spiritual things so God is pleased with me, going to church and reading my Bible and praying and serving and giving and these kinds of things. That I need to make sure I make it through this life as a generally good person. And those aren't necessarily bad goals, but Scripture tells us regardless of how good we try and be on our own, we can never be good enough to please God through our own effort or works or out of a desire to please Him. That one of the things that we see is uh, because we have all rebelled against God and been disobedient to Him, we rightly deserve to stand under the judgment of God. And yet, uh, our sin runs deeper than simply a choice that we made, that the Bible tells us that when we rebelled against God, we didn't just rebel against God and we remained neutral people who could choose God or not choose God, that when we rebelled against God, our hearts were uh, shaped and our minds were shaped and we were formed in such a way that our natural disposition left to ourselves is to no longer want anything to do with God, to not seek after Him, to not please Him. It's why Paul writes in Romans 3.20, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And so we take this approach to God. I'm just going to be good enough for God to be happy with me. I'm going to hear God's rules and I'm going to follow God's rules and things will go well for me in the end. And yet Paul says there's a problem with that kind of thinking. It's that sin has done a work in us so that when we hear the laws of God, there's something inside of us that wants to to disregard them and disobey them. And if you don't believe me, spend any amount of time with a four-year-old. And what I mean by that is this. The moment you tell them not to do something, nothing becomes more important in their life than doing that thing you've just told them not to do. And Paul says the same thing is true of Scripture. Last night I was hanging out with my four-year-old, my seven-year-old, We were making some tea because my wife was out with our oldest son at a birthday party. And he was standing there watching the water and we were heating the the teapot. And I told him, that's really hot. Do not touch it. And I would have been better not to say anything at all. Because the moment I said that, his wheels began turning. How close can I get my hand to this teapot without burning it? And I ran around the corner and I began to watch him and you could just see him staring at it. And he could see the flames coming off the gas stove and he could tell that this was a hot thing and I shouldn't touch it. And yet there was something inside of him that just so desperately wanted to see how close can I get my hand to this teapot without burning myself. And Paul says when we open scripture apart from God's help, something similar happens in all of us. It's that sin takes advantage of the laws of God and begins to make us ask the question, how close can I get to the edge of sin? How far can I push the envelope? And because of that just propensity we have to disobey God, Paul says no one's ever going to be able to be good enough in their own effort or discipline or will to be right with God. And yet, that doesn't mean that we're without hope in this life. In that Hebrews 9 passage we read a little earlier, I want to read a little further into that section because we read, just as it is appointed for man to die once and then to face judgment. Verse 28, so Christ, having been offered to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly are waiting for him. Again, it's appointed for us all to stand before God in judgment and out of his love for us. We're told in Hebrews 9, God sent Jesus as a sacrifice to be offered once to bear the sins of many. 
And the incredible truth of the gospel is this, is that we have disobeyed God. We have rebelled against God. And on the cross, Jesus takes our sin and our rebellion and our disobedience on himself. And he identifies himself by our sin. And those things that we let no one else know, that, that evil that's inside of us that we keep hidden from other people, that people would look differently at us if they knew we had those thoughts and, and those kinds of things going on in our heart, Jesus takes on himself and all on the cross, that judgment of God that we deserve to suffer, Jesus takes on himself and experiences fully and in a very real sense pays the debt to God that we owed. And then the incredible truth of the gospel is this, is that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus and believe he died as our substitute, he died uh, on the cross, dying the death that we deserve to die. That God can now look at us in our imperfection, in uh, just all that we are over the course of this life and utter some incredible things about us like we are forgiven and like we are holy and saints and a part of the family of God, not because we cleaned ourselves up, not because we earned those titles, but because Jesus lived the sinless life we could never live, died the death we deserve to die, and raised from the dead to give us the promise of new life. It's this incredible gift that Jesus is offering to us, and at one level, the, in the inevitability of death does bring this realization. That if there is a God, and if there is life beyond this, then God has given me time right now to make this decision. What am I going to do to prepare for that day when I stand before Him? In essence, Ian Pravon writes, death is an evangelist. It helps us to see that there is a great goal fixed between creator and creature and places us in a position, therefore, truly to worship and repent of our sins. But the good news of the gospel extends further than the fact that our sins are forgiven. After Jesus died, he rose from the dead. And in that moment, defeated humanity's greatest enemy. This enemy that billionaires are spending millions of dollars to try and overcome 2,000 years ago, Jesus overcame in an instant. We read in 2 Timothy 1.10, And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The, the funny thing is, the solution that everyone is seeking to the problem of death has already been made available through the resurrection of Jesus, who, as we're told here, abolished death through his resurrection. It's what allowed Paul to say when he came to realize this in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? That there still is a pain associated with death and the separation we experience from others, but that the resurrection of Jesus really does transform that day because if our hope is in him, death is no longer the extinguishing of our lives. Rather, it's the transition to experience real and true and lasting life in the presence of our Savior. And if this is true, we do remember that we will die, but not with the spirit of fear or trepidation or hesitancy. But we remember this, this life is not all that there is. And I will stand before God someday. And he has offered a way for me to know that I can be made right with him. And it's that reminder that there's a finish line to life on this earth. And I don't know when that day will come that forces me and causes me and leads me to Keep Jesus at the forefront of my life. And few things other than that there's a reminder that this life is not all that there is can push us into that constant reliance and focus on Christ. I'll close with this and the band can come up and we'll get ready to sing. Thomas Brooks was an English Puritan preacher and author in the 1600s. And though he's best known for many of his books and theological treaties, we have several of his sermons in print some of which are funeral sermons. In one funeral sermon, Brooks reminds his listeners that for the believer, death not only ceases to be our conqueror, death actually becomes God's meek helper. He wrote, death is another Moses. It delivers believers out of bondage and from making bricks in Egypt. He continued, remember this, death, death does that in a moment 
which no graces, no duties, nor any ordinances could do for a man in his lifetime. Death frees a person from those diseases, corruption, temptations, that no duties, nor graces, nor ordinances could do. Every prayer, then, when we die, shall have its answer. All hungering and thirsting shall be filled and satisfied. Every sigh, groan, and tear that has fallen from the saints' eyes shall be recompensed. That is not death, but life which joins the dying man to Christ. I'm going to pray and we'll sing. Father, thank you for this morning and our time together. God, I pray that in the coming moments you would help us to remember um, that we don't know how much time we have left on this earth, that we will stand before you someday, and that in the days we have left, you have made us an offer. You have offered us your grace. And if we will trust and believe that Jesus is Savior and spend our lives following him, that our sins can be forgiven, that we can be made right with you, and that we can have hope that the end of this physical life is not the end of our existence, but really is the beginning of life as you intended it to be. Father, thank you for the hope that you give us. Thank you for the time that you've given us to respond. Help us to make the most of um, the time that we have on this earth, serving you, loving you, pursuing you, and bringing others into your kingdom. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the good gifts you've given us. We ask this all in your son's name. Amen.